knockdown, a young guy. This is but... not where Guinea wants to be in the corner. Like you said, it's a phone book fight, and they'll wave it off. Three... This is what happens when the contents of your trash talk far outweigh the measure of your fighting talent. There's nothing quite like seeing a trash talking bully get totally handled. So get ready for some memorable showdowns. You know, I, I really don't care that he's off the hook because you know what it is? The first person he's going to step in the ring with is with me, and I'm a dangerous man. I'm a dangerous man. So yeah. far away, come. Come. Fuck. 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 You know, I, you know what time it is now, innit? You can't even look at me and look into my eyes. It's going to be tomorrow night. It's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. No help. No one's going to help you tomorrow night. Ain't nobody going to help you tomorrow night. You need help, not me. You need help, not me. We all saw what AJ did. We all saw what AJ did one-on-one. -on -one. On the long list of incredibly annoying YouTube boxers that somehow talk their way onto our videos every week, we gotta give a special shout out to Ryan Taylor, cause this dude is on another level. And look, his opponent, Slim Albahar, pretty irritating in his own right. But Taylor definitely takes the top spot in my book. He spoke with the confidence of a world champ, promising a punishment for his opponent that he was never realistically gonna be capable of delivering. Thankfully, the great thing about the sport of boxing is that these idiots are forced to attempt to back up their words, giving us the perfect opportunity to sort out the talkers from the legitimate fighters. Now, I'm not saying that Slim is anything more than a low-level fighter, but for all intents and purposes, he proved himself to be miles ahead of Taylor on fight night. And we gotta say, we enjoyed every second of it. There was no quick knockout or rapid conclusion to this one. No, this one was a drawn-out beatdown. The kind of whooping that really serves as a lesson to the fighter who gets it. And again, you want to mix it up with Slim? He's going to hit you with a leg one. That hard hand sent Taylor down. This is what I told you guys. Taylor got his beating spread out over the course of the fight's entire duration, taking an ungodly amount of damage that left him as a bloody mess when all was said and done. Another right hook from. Oh, big right hand! Slim's not going to go away that easy, guys. Ryan is eating them shots. It was a humbling night at the office for this loudmouth, and though he didn't get finished, that's just about the only nice thing we can say about this embarrassing performance. Why? Why? Why would you ask a question of Fedor? <laughs> what are you expecting to get from this? You could take the J train downtown, just ask your question to the Brooklyn Bridge. And architecturally, it would be more stimulating than you're going to get from Fedor. Have you seen him with his shirt off? Everybody wants to know what Fedor is thinking, and I can promise you guys he's up here thinking the same thing you'd be thinking, which is why in God's name did I get on the wrong side of Chael Sonnen? Chael Sonnen might not win every big fight that he finds himself in. Quite the opposite, actually. But when it comes to his work on the mic, there are few, if any, who can measure up to him. So when Fedor Emelianenko signed a late career fight with the American Gangster, it was clear that the Russian was comfortable letting Chael win at the press conferences, confident in the knowledge that the actual fighting edge would be on his side. Chael didn't disappoint, comparing Emelianenko to an inanimate object, incapable of delivering good trash talk. He also took shots at Fedor's record in Japan, calling his run in pride the result of fixed fights and promoter and referee corruption. Fedor's going to win all those fights in Japan, and he's 3-2 and two in America, and one of those wins is over a guy that was flipping tires at Sam's Club the month before. The Japanese circuit is fake. It's always been fake. None of those guys won those fights. They never won those fights. Whether Chael actually believed this or not is irrelevant, because when the time came to fight, he would be forced to answer for his words. And as a natural middleweight, he was about to realize that his pursuit of heavyweight glory was a step too far. Look, the fight between these two aging icons was never going to be anything more than a sloppy mess, but Fedor was still very clearly the more technically astute fighter. Even when Chael managed to secure top position or a takedown, Emelianenko's natural athleticism and strength allowed him to quickly reverse position and resume raining down on the bad guy with big grounded pound. Nice move by Chael to get to that mountain. This is where, on the ground, in this position, Looking to finish right here, right now. He's not being hurt. Yeah, this wasn't overly competitive, and when the TKO came for Fedor, it was the expected result. Emelianenko might not be the biggest heavyweight in the world, but he certainly belongs in that division. Don't overlook my experience, don't overlook my power, and don't overlook my skills. I never did, and I never do with any fighter. I know what he's going to bring, and I'm ready, believe me. I'm being in, in the ring with all kind of fighters. 
Not Jamel Charlo. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, but that you don't know. You don't you don't experience this kind of level of fight. You will see. And you will learn. It's difficult to know just how much Jermel Charlo actually believed in himself prior to taking on one of the greatest pound-for-pound -pound fighters of his era, Canelo Alvarez. Because on paper, he appeared to be outgunned in almost every department imaginable. And sure enough, there was a level of confidence to Canelo pre-fight that Charlo just couldn't match. His trash talk was still there, though, as he told Alvarez not to make the mistake of overlooking him, playing the underdog angle to its fullest. But Canelo would not be drawn into making any mistakes, and Jermel's attempts to convince the fans that this was anything more than a tune-up for Alvarez fell flat. And don't get me wrong, Jermel's a damn good fighter, just like his brother. But there was a major stylistic gulf between these two men, and it didn't take an expert to know what the expected result would be. Canelo had a calm, cool, collected air about him throughout the entire buildup, and he was truly immune to Charlo's attempts to provoke him into a mental slip-up. And that professionalism translated perfectly to fight night, with Canelo finding very little resistance to his game over the course of the 12 rounds of action. Definitely great, great condition that we've seen. And when he dropped Charlo to one knee with a huge overhand, you could just see how dejected Jermel looked. Yeah. Sometimes he would just hook his way. As he realized that his chances of providing an upset were slipping away, and fast. In the end, Canelo shut his opponent down and confidently shut him up, winning a comfortable decision in one of his easier fights in recent years. Canelo is just on another level to most of these guys, especially if there's no weight advantage going against him. Sleep on him at your own peril, folks. Who knows exactly what it was that got Joel Casamayor so fired up prior to his bout with the great Juan Manuel Marquez, but man, he really stepped on the gas during their weigh-in face-off. This dude was so damn confident in his ability to get under his opponent's skin, wearing a sombrero in mockery of the one that Marquez was wearing before then trying to knock it off his head. He hilariously also knocked his own off in the process. At the time, Marquez was already well on his way towards his icon status. But Joel has very good reason to be confident, bringing a 36-3-1 record to the table with a streak of five wins. But Marquez was clearly backed by the fans and the odds makers to get the job done. When Casamayor tried to touch Manuel's face and hit him with the Cuban flag, things were always in danger of boiling over. It was the classic Cuba versus Mexico rivalry, and Casamayor looked as confident as ever coming in. He had never once been finished, and up to that point, he'd never even been knocked down in his 40 professional bouts. Managed to get him out of there in the 10th round. He did. He made it here at first flush. There was a right hand that Casamayor never saw. And another right. right. He can reach, Marquez. He's able to get in there the right punch and distance like he did. But thankfully, his display of bravado would be punished in suitable fashion because all of that aggressive energy would leave him totally open to a career-changing beatdown from the icon Marquez. All that talk about Casamayor's granite chin went flying out the window as soon as that 11th round came. So he believes he's stronger. Uppercut in the right hand from Marquez and a left hand from Casamayor. When Marquez had him hurt, all of that pre-fight frustration right was let out in one furious onslaught. This was nasty work from Marquez. Took a good shot right. A lot of times people see a brawl, they think that's a good fight. And he, drops he opened up with a huge flurry of shots, breaking Joel down punch by punch, testing that chin until it could take no more. He's big right hand slipped in. By As you said, a judge's nightmare so far. Didn't look at me like it was low. Didn't me either from that cut above the eye. And when that final killing blow came, it was a satisfying end to this furious rivalry. Nothing seems to bother him in the country, and he has done a very good job. That could have been a, a problem. No, Casemiro is upset about the size of the ring. It's a 20-foot ring. See, this is advantage as a, as a power puncher. When Casemiro finally hit the canvas, 
We're guessing that Marquez enjoyed it quite a lot. I think that's a good fight. And he drops him in a... Um, I swear you okay. say this every time. I swear you say this every time to all of your opponents. So look what happens. You end up getting iron out, and it's just embarrassing. You're just setting yourself up to get a meme for the third time in a row. Like, what are you doing? Hang up the gloves, bro. You, you, you lost the gin too. Hang up the gloves. It's gonna be one of them. What? Your gloves, Jim. When I hit that button, it's game over. You're gonna be for the third time. Where am I? Like these photos. That is gonna be you. You're like. If YouTube Boxing had an award for its most annoying member, this Ginty guy should really be up for consideration. The way he trash-talked Faye's temper was the most arrogant-sounding thing you'll ever hear featured on this channel. His smarmy approach to trying to downplay his opponent's punching power really painted him in the most unlikable way imaginable. And look, we're not saying that Faye's is much better, but hearing Ginty talk about his right-hand power was kind of hilarious. For a guy who's not even a low-level pro, this dude sure did have a whole lot of confidence in his ability to break his opponent. And sure, we had already seen FaZe lose twice by knockout, including once to KSI. But Ginty had this very annoying quality to him, like his trash talk was setting him up for an almighty fall. In other words, this dude was just begging to end up as a viral laughing stock. All he needed to do now was go out there and totally bottle it on the big stage. And thankfully, it didn't take long for that to happen. Having skills on the mic is one thing, and let's be real, his aren't great. But when compared to his actual yeah, boxing talent, this dude was a modern day Shakespeare. Cool and collected, or does he rush the process? Well, we know Ginty will go out on his shield. Firefight here in the middle. Oh, oh, oh. Seriously, this guy's boxing was awful. Some of the worst produced by the usually terrible standards of YouTube combat sports. Well, from these knockdowns, young guy. This is but, not where Ginty wants to be in the corner. He was jabbing at air, way out of range, like he was throwing punches purely for the cameras. And when the time came to get up close and personal, his promises about his power fell apart. Flick of the wrist. Whoa! Scored. Ginty ran down! That quick! Ginty got knocked down a grand total of three times in the opening round alone, forcing the ref to stand in and save him from becoming an even bigger joke. Ginty wants to be in the corner. Like you said, it's a phone book. Yeah, this was one of the most embarrassing things you'll ever see in a boxing ring. Absolutely laughable. Eso a ti no te, no te, no te garantiza que el sábado te voy a romper tu cara y tu cabeza. Te voy a romper mi corazón. But this doesn't guarantee on Saturday night I'm not going to, you know, take your head off. Thank you. One more, one more time, Jaime, that translation. He, he said, you know, this doesn't guarantee me giving you the cap that on Saturday night I'm not going to take your head off. Javier Fortuna tried to get Pally with Ryan Garcia ahead of their collision in the ring, bringing him a hat and generally not bringing an aggressive attitude at first. But all that went out the window when he started talking. No, Fortuna was not here to make friends, not one bit. And as soon as he had his chance, his nice guy act slipped entirely. And he began to threaten Garcia getting right up in the young fighter's face, promising to end him once the fighting began. But here's the thing. One of these athletes was on the rise, and the other was coming to the end of his run. And his desperate attempts to sell his chances to the general public were not taken as seriously as he'd hoped. And when he actually got right up in Garcia's face, there was zero fear in his opponent's eyes, nothing that could be used to offset his mental toughness. Fortuna might not have realized that in the moment he had bitten off more than he could chew. That's a good thing. I don't want any excuses. There it is, the I like main event. But trust me, that moment was fast approaching. Ryan Garcia might have found himself out of his depth in his own career at one time or another, but this was not one of those occasions. He was the A-side, and Fortuna was about to get a major slice of humble pie. Garcia was dominant in this bout, totally in control of his opponent's threat levels. The first knockdown came in round four, before Garcia followed it up in round five with another. Landed through three, Garcia 33, Fortuna 14, as Garcia starting to press forward. He said he was going to start pushing the tempo in the fourth round, and a body shot sits Fortuna down! But it was the sixth round, and the third time that Fortuna hit the canvas, that forced him out of the contest. You could just see the shock written on his face. Ryan Garcia should be beating this guy. Look how much taller he is. But guess what? People want to throw oh, and he caught him with a left hook again. And Javier Fortuna may not want to absorb any 
more punishment here tonight. Out comes the mouthpiece. Javier was forced to accept that he was simply not good enough, not quick enough, and unable to stand up to the power punching of the opponent he'd clearly disrespected in the lead up to this big money matchup. He's punch drunk, he can't take a shot anymore, and I'm not finished with him, I'm going to retire him. You and your trainer are going to fail in this quest to me. Your failures already, but I'm going to just verify that I'm working. I'll wait for you on March 12th. Remember, I'm going to knock you out in less than in four rounds. Remember this. I see scare, I see fear in your eyes. Ricardo Mayorga has a real talent for getting under people's skin. Is it the fact that he's a naturally abrasive person who will say or do anything to provoke someone? Probably, but he certainly plays it up for the cameras. Making a point of smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol profusely during his camp. And if you watch this channel, you'll know that we have several Mayorga highlights that prove just how hardcore he can be when he doesn't respect or particularly like his opponents. When he from Ricardo, but make no mistake, he quit on himself in there. But this nigga never knocked out door about how the f knocked me. What are you talking about, Bill? Come on, cut the bullshit, bro. Cut the f bullshit. I'll tell you, you never knocked out nobody. Okay. I asked him who he okay. knocked out. He said okay. he left. He left, bro. Come on, come on. Boxing match. You can't. No, I said I can't. He said, can you? Can you do it? I said yes. But if I hurt you, I'm gonna get you out of there. Why would I box you if I can hurt you? All right, that's cool. How many knockouts he had? Probably more than you. Against niggas we never heard of. Who you knocked out? Against niggas we never heard of, right? Who did you knock? If there's a fitting way to describe Regis Progress' attempts to trash talk Devin Haney, it would be loud and aggressive. There was an arrogance to the way he tried to big brother Haney, pushing this cocky attitude as he tried to come across as superior to his young opponent. But this is yet another example of a fighter who's on the rise. meeting with a guy who's coming to the end of their run. And look, Progre is a championship level fighter, a belt holder, and a man who deserved to be taken seriously as a threat to anyone at the top level. But as Regis tried to make this conversation about punching power, coming for him strong, he has the height, he has the shoulders, Devin Haney stops. Still has to be careful against a puncher like Regis Progre. Progre Haney just sat there laughing in response. Because for as much as, and sure, Haney isn't a KO artist, not by any means, boxing fights are not won and lost on pure power. And up to that point, Devin had shown himself to be an outstanding technical fighter. Big Regis! That hurt Regis! Oh, Regis waved Devin in. Look. A guy who could shut down masterful opponents over 12 rounds. Guys like George Cambosis and even Vassal Lomachenko, although that fight was closer. The fans expected a tight fight, but Devin Haney was about to make a huge statement. But man, this fight was not competitive. If you needed any more proof of Devin Haney's ascent towards pound-for-pound -pound greatness, this is it. Over the course of 12 rounds, It looks like biggest mistake of Progray is fighting at this distance. Gary, both feet are, are stepping in the range that Devin Haney works. Haney confidently proved that Regis was simply not on his level. This fight was not close, not even slightly. From start to finish, this 25-year-old budding superstar beat the brakes off of Regis. Right here, that's exactly what speed does, Todd. Speed and accuracy tame any beast, no matter how hard you like he's done during this fight tonight. Well, he's given Regis Progre the exact kind of fight that to do with the Making the difference in technique crystal clear. All that pre-fight talk was shown to have been empty noise, totally lacking in substance. A bitter pill for Progre to swallow, but he had no one to blame but himself. Who are you, Kuba? Um, yeah. You come, you come, you, you come to the uh, Freak Federation, yeah? Yeah, yeah? So you could, so what? Yeah. So, so you, you yeah, have yeah. the problem. Yeah, I can fight. There's a big difference between looking tough and being tough. And for Peter Saliga, when he signed on the dotted line to take on the UFC veteran Norman Park in a bizarre mixed rules bout, 
He didn't realize how limited his own skills would be made to look, but he certainly tried his best to get in Norman's head pre-fight, mean mugging him at every opportunity while trying every single trick in the book to attempt to win the mental battles. He even tried to make him flinch with a fake punch at one point. But Park was no newbie to the fight game, and he knew that Piotr was at a serious disadvantage, even with the fight being as strange as it was. Basically, the two would compete in this tiny cage, with the first round being purely boxing, before the entire MMA skill set would become available for round two onwards. Seems like a real sideshow kind of event, doesn't it? Well, if that was the case, Shaliga was clearly the clown of the two. And while some low-level scrub might have been intimidated by him and his general demeanor, Storm and Norman was a legitimately solid fighter who had absolutely nothing to fear from his cocky and arrogant opponent. In round one, Norman went to work beating the brakes off Shaliga with his far superior punching ability. Forcing this guy to understand just how far out of his depth he was. But if you thought that was bad, you gotta remember that Park is an MMA fighter first and foremost, a very talented MMA fighter too. And when the second round got underway, Park moved to a finishing position with little trouble, and when the referee realized that Peter was done, he stepped in and saved him from any more punishment. The lesson? Well, having muscles and a mean dog attitude can be helpful when selling a fight. But if you ain't got the talent to back it all up, good luck avoiding a spot in one of our videos. And that's exactly what you saw here.